But I want to welcome you to, uh, to SD worship. I know you were hoping to worship in HD, but we're going to worship in SD, uh, socially distant worship. And <clears throat> yes, there are a few of us here. We have taken all the precautions that we can take. Uh, in other words, from where I'm looking, there are people over this way, and then for where I'm looking, there's also people over this way, and now the sound has changed drastically, did it change for you all too? Um, but uh, welcome to this uh, time of worship. This is very unique, it is very different, it feels very awkward, and I have to be honest with you, some of us in the room are actually a little bit anxious, because we don't come to do worship with a handful of people. We come to do worship in the community that we've come to know. And so we're trying as best we can to offer this opportunity for us to worship as community. Worship will never be canceled because God is always available and always with us and, and wants our connection. And so that's what worship is about. It's about connecting with God. So we will always be attentive to worship and working towards worship and just sharing our joy and our celebrations and our sorrows in that community of faith. But yes, this is a different kind of worship. We are in community, but we are not together. We are apart from one another, but yet we are one in, in spirit and one in heart and one in, in sharing and doing ministry together. And so we, uh, we share this day in worship. And so I want to say welcome to you. Glad you're joining us. Uh, maybe you're a part of the New Horizon uh, Church community, and we're glad that you're here. Maybe you found us somewhere or stumbled across us or friends have hooked you up, or whatever, we're just glad that you're here to do this. Generally in worship, what we do at this point, after I've done some welcomes, is have everybody stand up and greet one another, which is certainly not socially distant. Uh, but here's what I'm going to invite you to do sometime today to be in community. I want you to call and connect with somebody today. I want you to pick up the phone and make a contact with somebody that you haven't talked to in the past few days. Somebody that maybe you look for on Sunday morning, but you're not seeing them today. Someone that maybe you know is in a situation where they are extremely uh, distant from folks um, or might be in the need of a, of a contact or a friendly call. So what I want to challenge you to do today as part of passing the peace of Christ is to call somebody and make a contact today. Amen? Amen. Well, let's enter into worship. Let's enter into worship. Yeah, you can turn over to the... We have the band here with us. We have the praise team here with us. We have folks uh, working our sound. It's not more than uh, 10 people in a classroom-sized space. We're all spread out, but we are safe, and uh, let's enter into a time of worship and share together. We know that God's grace is sufficient to keep each and every one of us. So with everything that's happening, we're just going to give God everything that he deserves, which is the praise, the glory, the honor, the glory, because it's due to his matchless name. Great is your faithfulness.
this church. And if you'll bow your heads and join with me in our morning prayer. Lord, we gather together this morning, although not in each other's presence, we gather together this morning as a people fully united and in need of your presence. We gather to worship you, the Lord of peace in a time where the world would have us choose chaos, the Lord of strength in our times of weakness, the Lord of wisdom in our times of confusion, the Lord of love when we're feeling lost and alone, the Lord of comfort when we're hurting and grieving, and the Lord of possibility when all seems hopeless. Help us to so be in your presence in these moments that we draw strength from your word. Help us to be so in your presence that our worries are set aside in our awe and wonder of what you can do. Help us to carry your presence with us as we go through the trying days to come. We pray all this as your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hi, I'm Pastor Peyton, and I wanted to share a little bit about the mission that is going on in this church during this crazy time. Um, one of the things that we do on a regular basis is we nourish the lives of children and we nourish the lives of those in our community. And this is no different. Um, spring break came a little bit earlier than we thought it was gonna come this year. And we didn't get our bags of food out to our children, but our community came together and we've been part of conversations and part of a solution from a task force, including Broward County Schools and lots of feeding organizations in the community to make sure that those families in our community that need to be served are served. This week alone, we've given out over 100 bags of food to children and families as well as seniors in need and making sure that that happens. We've done it in a safe way. We've made it possible for bags to be delivered and dropped on doorsteps or people to come and pick up here, but always in numbers that were less than 10 and always in ways that was just sort of like a curbside pickup. And I'm excited to say that we're gonna be part of the solution going forward. Um, one of the things that I feel um, sort of confident in as, as well as hopeful in is that we are part of the solution to feed our children. This week is a hard week because schools are out in Broward County, so there won't be meals for the children. Um, coming back in right after spring break, we are working on a solution with several leaders in the community, as well as church leaders with Broward County Schools, with a coalition of organizations to make sure that children are fed going forward in the best ways that we can. Many, many people keep asking me, how can I help, how can I help? And I love that about our community. I love that about our church. And there's gonna be so many ways to help. Right now, the biggest help we can do is prayer. We always need financial resources. Uh, we are working on making sure that food is available when we need food. And there will be a time that we'll need to have different shifts come in and prepare food to be delivered and to be packed. I will be setting up this week, um, we use a service called Remind, and we will make sure that it's on our website and it's on our Facebook page, but um, you can sign up, that's an opt-in service, so that you can see what we need when we need it. Sometimes we just need somebody to deliver a bag, sometimes we need somebody to come and be here for an hour or so as families come and drive through. Sometimes we may need some help for a few people to come and do some work to prepare the food. But if you're interested in that reminder, I will make sure that it's up this week and I will keep you abreast of what's going on with updates through that service as well. But just rest assured that we are part of the solution. We are loving and nourishing the lives of the people in our community and we are gonna be on the front lines making sure that the people in our community are loved and feel the love of Christ. 
Thanks so much. We're going to share with you now in the uh, 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me be beside restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good nature. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you're with me. Your rod and your staff. They protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. Amen. Amen. Most gracious God, as we share today in your scripture and your word may we share in a sense of spirit and in truth wherever we are and everywhere that we are may we worship you in jesus name amen amen so the scripture is from the gospel of john and it's about a life-changing event um and uh you know what i just realized that i asked my staff I said everybody when you get up introduce yourself I'm Pastor Rafe. <laughs> I'm Pastor Rafe Vigil, one of the pastors at the New Horizon Methodist community in Southwest Ranches, Cooper City, Davie, Pembroke Pines area of Florida. Today we look at a fairly lengthy story, but a powerful story because it's a powerful story of a life transformed and a life completely changed. And when a world changes for someone, as it might be for us these days. John chapter 9, as Jesus uh, walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went away and washed. When he returned, he could see. The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, Isn't this the man who used to sit and, and beg? Some said, It is. And others said, No, it's someone who looks like him. But the man said, Yes, yes, it's me. So they asked him, How are you? now able to see. He answered, the man that they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes, and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. They asked, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on the Sabbath day. So the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. The man told them, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I see. Some Pharisees said, this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. Others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So, so they were divided. Some of the Pharisees questioned the man who had been born blind again. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? He replied, he's a prophet. The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents. 
the Jewish leaders asked them, is this your son? Are you saying he was born blind? How can he now see? The parents answered, we know. We know he is our son. We know he was born blind. But we don't know how he now sees, and we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This is because the Jewish authorities had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he's old enough, ask him. Therefore they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And the man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind, and now I see. They questioned him. What did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? He replied, I already told you, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. <clears throat> We know that God spoke through Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, this is incredible. You don't know where he's from, yet he healed my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. No one has ever heard of a healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. They responded, you were born completely in sin. How is it that you dare to teach us? They, then they expelled him. Jesus heard that they had expelled the man born blind. Finding him, finding him, Jesus said, do you believe in the human one? He answered, who is he, sir? I, I want to believe, believe in him. And Jesus said, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped Jesus. So Jesus said, I have come into the world to excise judgment so that those who don't see can see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard what he said and asked, Surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Amen. Amen. Most gracious God, we feel so distant today. In fact, we may feel like our world is drastically changing. And it is. Into that, Lord, speak some good news. Speak some hope. Let us hear your word and story. Amen. And amen. Um, how are you feeling this week? Uh, it's be good to reflect on the last week, the last ten days, and and just pay attention to how you're feeling and, and what's going on and, and what you were going through. Because I know that for me, as I sat back and reflected, and I had to take up a lot of time and actually uh, social media disconnect for a while on Friday and Saturday, just to reflect a little bit on what had been going on and what's been going on in my heart. And I found out that and realized that I had been working at a, at a much different pace. I mean, I had been doing life at a much different pace. I don't mean just work, 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 but I mean just like doing life in a whole different kind of pace. I was like, always felt like I was hurrying to the next thing. Not hurrying necessarily through what I was, uh, getting through what I was at, but like the next thing I had to get to it. And I felt like I really had to, to get there. And so I found myself uh, not having a pace and not having a, a peace of mind. In fact, my mind seemed to be spinning all of the time. Um, I was like, I, I realized that I was always in a hurry to get to my devotionals. I was always in a hurry to get to 
reading the scripture. And then, of course, when I got there, my mind would still be spinning and I'd be thinking about a, a million different things. I was always worried about the next thing. And when you're always worried about the next thing, sometimes it's really hard to be present in the thing that you're in. And then, of course, you're forgetting about some of the other things that we have to do. I mean, it's been an emotional week, hasn't it? It's been a difficult time. It has been a, a tough week because we are in the midst of world-changing events. And this is world-changing. In fact, I just realized right now that I'm in a world-changing event because there's so few people in here, I'm just looking in one direction. And usually on Sunday mornings, I'm used to looking everywhere and saying hi to everybody and turning everywhere and doing all that. But my world has changed right now. And here's the thing. Beyond this, everything's going to be totally different again. These are world-changing events. And I've discovered in my life, when my life has been going through a world-changing event, I do get anxious to get to the Scripture to get to the word, to get to something of hope. Many of you all know, because I've, I've shared it, that you know, world-changing event for me was a divorce. Many years ago, I went through a divorce, and that's a world-changing event. I was anxiously turning to the scripture, going to the scripture. I remember spending like, like one time, like two or three weeks, like that's all I could do in any moment of spare time, was like go through the scripture, find something of hope, find something that would give me direction, find something that would, that would lead me, you know, because this world-changing event was right there. And, you know, world-changing events sometimes are events that we choose, and sometimes they're thrust upon us. You know, they just happen like this pandemic. Like Hurricane Andrew, another world-changing event for me. Actually, kind of like right on top of the whole divorce thing. But Andrew was a time, a world-changing event, and I found myself running to the Scripture to find a sense of calm and pace because there was so much to do. <laughs> and, and my world, being a, a South Florida boy, my world was and would ever be completely different after Hurricane Andrew. But then there are world-changing events that we choose, right? We choose some of them, and some of them are, are really good world-changing events. Like for me, the, the choice and, and Amy's choice for us to come together and be married nearly 25 years ago, world-changing. World-changing. I mean, we were single parents, both of us, and coming together and blending a family, and, uh, and, and both of us having financial issues that, uh, and baggage that we were carrying, and coming together and, and working on that and changing that perspective. And then uh, uh, for Amy, I said, look, I've got so much baggage, we've got to go to premarital counseling. And I made her go to premarital counseling with me. And then we just unloaded all of that baggage and all of that kind of stuff and, and dealt with everything. And it was difficult and it was world-changing and it was just an unbelievable healing that God did. But it still changed the world for me and for my perspective. It changed everything. And I bet if you're a person that's born blind and then all of a sudden in one day you see, I bet that's a world-changing event. And here's the thing. When the world changes for one person, we know by our social network nature, and that's what makes this thing so odd for us, because we're asked to be socially distant when we are created to be socially connected people. But when the world changes for one person, it threatens and changes and transforms the world for a community, for society for the relationship connections. And so a man who's born blind, who all of a sudden sees, is part of a world-changing kind of experience. The man is born blind. He's a, he's a man. He's of legal age. His parents want to make sure everybody knows that because he can decide for himself. He can choose for himself. He can think for himself. He can function his whole life on his own. But his world, his condition, his situation is completely transformed. He's been a man who's been blind from birth. 
He's had this condition on his life. He has adapted as we hear his questions and his answers and, and his part of the story. We understand that he's educated. He's got some reflective capabilities. His, you know, his mental acuity is there. But also he's been forced to be a beggar, which means everybody kind of knows who he is. He's adapted. His blindness, his condition was his reality. Now, everything changes. Everything changes. The whole world turns upside down. The culture around him is going to make him, make the seemingly good news, oh, the blind can see, but the culture around him is going to make it seem harsh and anxious and stressful, filled with questions and interrogation. When your world changes, good news or bad news, when your world changes, it's stressful. It's it produces anxiety. That's going to happen. The man can see, and everything and everyone around him is questioning and adds to the stress. They want to understand. They want to get a hold of it, but it's a mystery. And understand this. Every miracle is a mystery. And the debate on, on how this happened and what happens next threatens the traditional historic nature of the faith community and they want to figure it out and his family is drawn in because you know when somebody changes it changes the whole family right anybody who's gone through a family that's had an addicted person in the family understands that when the addicted person becomes clean everybody's happy no some people struggle with the change and the change in relationships and how that works the patterns are different when our world changes, the world struggles, and we struggle together. Jesus changes everything. Jesus entered this man's life and changes everything. And Jesus changes everything when he enters into our lives. Maybe that's why we kind of like keeping Jesus socially distant, right? Let's keep Jesus at least six feet off, because if he gets too close, he's going to change everything. And that's what happens when Jesus becomes close. But when Jesus is close, Jesus can love us through the world shift that happens in our lives. Because here's the good news of the story. What I think is the good news. Jesus came searching for the man again. He came searching for the man again and found him to care for him into the future. And I think that's where our anxiety, at least a good part of our anxiety today in this pandemic comes, is the anxiety about the future. What are you worried about? What are you anxious about? What's grabbing a hold of you in the midst of this global and local and personal transformation that's happening through this? I know that I've got anxieties. I've got some Pretty good anxieties. Son number one is teaching in Qatar. He's overseas, and all of his military students have been sent home. The military of the country has been sent home for protection, and he's locked in his apartment and, uh, and can go around and drive around the city, and that's about it. Son number two was already at a time of transition in his life of moving from training to for a career and moving jobs and, trans and transitioning in housing, and all of that has been put into limbo. Son number three is supposed to graduate from Florida State, and he's home now, and yeah, he'll finish, but will he be able to walk? Will he be able to graduate? And, and the transition of life that happens with graduates and looking for work and the change of the economy, and will work be available? And son number four, the adoption that we've been working on is an international adoption for a boy who's getting old enough and pushing the age where laws would not, al would not allow immigration. I'm worried. What are you worried about? What are you anxious about? But I'm not only worried about my family. I've got some of these anxieties about our economy. Our economy, global and, and local, and, and our national economy, our, our nation wants to, to hand out money to folks to help. Well, that sounds really helpful, but whenever you hand out money to folks, there's always sneaky people who are trying to get that money from naive people. 
And that's going to create issues too. It's going to create a shift in relationships. Our economy, are the jobs going to be available? Which jobs are going to be available? Who's doing any kind of trade now? Nobody's going to be buying houses or buying cars at this time. Nobody's like that Old Testament prophet that in the midst of war and exile decided to buy property because God was coming back into to Jerusalem. Nobody's going to be doing that. And so our, our economy is going to, 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 to shift. And where will people find jobs? And children and families. I know you've seen it all over Facebook. People say, pay teachers more. You know, they're doing great jobs with our kids, you know. And people are being fun about you know, I have my kids at home and it's already overwhelming and that sort of thing. But there are many homes that were already fragile in the parent-child relationships. There are many homes where abuse was already there. There was already homes where the patient's line was already a very, very fine line. And what's going to happen in the next few weeks? Is there going to be more work for social workers and for Florida United Methodist Children's Home to enter into homes? Are we really going to be doing that? And you know, what's going to happen with, with families and with, with children in our, in our community? And of course, I worry about the church. Because if the economy changes, if people's jobs change, if, if people are transformed, that's going to transform the relationships in the community of faith. It's going to, it's going to change things. It's going to change our, our, our most treasured resource in being the body of Christ, and that's people. People and, and their presence and their servanthood. And yes, you're going to expect me to talk about the financial transitions that are happening. Yeah, 2020 budgets in a couple of weeks are just going to be out the window. Because giving will have changed and people's abilities to give will have changed. I'm worried. The church was already in a fragile place. Our denomination was already in a fragile place. And yet I was encouraged, like I said, I've been running to scripture. And I was greatly encouraged in a Bible study this week when I, when I heard this quote. As Christians, we need to be strong for the rest of the world. Dr. Carrie Nunez. We need to be strong for the rest of the world. So, so here's what I do know. And what I cling to. At the end of this story, at the end of this scripture, Jesus came looking for the man born blind. Jesus looked for him and came to him. His life was in transition, and Jesus was going to help that transition along. He had gone from begging to bewilderment to I don't know to here's the answers I can provide, to, well, maybe this guy's a prophet, to I believe, and to worship. To worship. To worship with a sense of joy. Because that's what worship is, is an expression of our relationship with God and with each other and this sense of joy. And it's so out of this anxiety comes this focus on Jesus and this worship. Each of us have life-changing events. And here's what I can say about my life-changing events. All of them, at the end of the story, have been good because Jesus came searching for me. And at the end of the story, there is a deeper faith. There is a deeper relationship with Jesus. There is a deeper relationship with the community of faith. And there is a deeper joy and a deeper sense of worship. Today we are blind. Blind in the mystery of the coronavirus, the COVID-19. What's next? What will happen? I don't know. But Jesus is here. Jesus is present. Jesus is searching for you and for me and for us. There will be a healing. There will be one day when we'll see. And in the midst of all of that, we continue to respond with worship. Worship, maybe it looks like worship like we're doing today. Maybe it looks like something different, but with worship. 
and we journey into this ministry. We journey into a mystery. We journey with questions. We journey with anxiety. We journey with the being oppressed by the culture around us, it seems like. We journey with this oppression of social distancing and rules and laws. We, we struggle through this world-changing event, but we struggle through it with Jesus with the body of Christ, the community of faith. And so we come through this with Jesus. We come through this with worship. We come through this with joy in a whole new world that will be ours to share the love of Christ in. Amen? Amen. Most gracious God, help us in our anxiety and in our worry. Help us in our struggle. Help us in what seems to be an oppressive kind of situation. Help us to see that all that's happening in, in, in governments and in society and around the globe is all done in, to help people, to help us weather this storm and to move through and and to come to a new place and a new land on the other side. Lord, walk with us through the, the blindness that we might feel ourselves in and into that place of sight and that journey to a place of true worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your one and only Son who gave himself that we might have the miracles of life and of joy and of peace and of love in the midst of whatever struggle we face. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to invite you to share in your faith, to share in a statement of your faith. And so you can share in this, perhaps you know it by heart, perhaps you're reading it on on something. If you're in a place where you want to stand up, stand up. If you're laying in bed watching this, I understand. But it's still a statement of our faith and it deserves our voice. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to, again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And amen. I want to just take a moment to invite you, as any worship service would, there would be an offering, because that's our response to God. It's part of, one of our responses to God. You heard a mission moment earlier about ways that you can respond in, in giving in that way. And so I also want to encourage you to go to the uh, links that will help you on the websites and that sort of thing, you know, all those different electronic ways in which you can give directly to uh, New Horizon uh, United Methodist Church. You can give directly to the mission and the ministry like the Nourishing Lives that happens. You can give directly to God's work to uh, continue. It, it's not passing an offering plate? No, it's, you know, that's what you're used to. But it is maybe the new way we worship and the new way we give of ourselves and being accountable at home to go through the process and the procedures electronically to share our gifts, to share our ties, to share our faithfulness with the community of faith. We're going to uh, conclude our time of worship with a, a song and a blessing. And so uh, may God's blessings be with us as we uh, sing together.
hope that you have been uh, blessed in uh, this time of worship. And as we do a, a sending and a blessing, um, let me encourage you to uh, pay attention to the news and uh, the guidelines that are given by reputable news forces and the, um, the medical uh, people that are out there, the CDC and all of those others. Pay attention to that and, and do that and follow those safety precautions because that is not only an act of protecting yourself, it is an act of love towards others. And so as we say now to go in peace and to go and share God's love, one of the ways that we share God's love is by following what is necessary in our society and our culture right now that loves people by keeping them safe and keeping them from the transmission of this disease and, and encouraging and strengthening our uh, medical fields and medical work so that they can get ahead of this and continue to help us to live in healthy and productive lives. So as you go and you love on others, contact someone today, but contact them by phone, and follow all of the guidelines that are faithfully. Support local businesses, support friends, support in ways that you can, and, uh, and care for others in ways that truly build the community of, that God intends as we work together through this. Go now with blessing and peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.